She looks a fright, her manner is objectionable, and she has no talent. She runs the gamut of emotions from A to B. She can show no emotion except by dilating her nostrils. That's what they were saying about her 60 years ago. Somehow, the early years of Catherine Hepburn's career are so well known for her failures and, of course, her box office poison period, that it is easy to forget the big sensation she caused with her arrival in Hollywood and how her unique style and acting talent overcame the fact that she was seen right from the start as an outsider by many in the industry. You think it's fair to leave me alone for hours? Oh, don't be absurd, Kit. It was only for 10 minutes. Besides, I must give a little attention to my guests. Hey, and I drifted into acting. I loved the sort of giving little plays with a theater, a little theater that I had to my younger brothers and sisters. And I did those plays. But I can't remember. I really don't know why. I think I drifted into it. Like many other actresses that came to Hollywood during these years, Catherine Hepburn began her career on stage. Still, even if she came from the theater and it was a play that later helped her to return to Hollywood, she does not really have the reputation of a stage actress. The longevity of her movie career saw her growing old in front of the camera and has connected her closely with the big screen forever. And even if she started on the stage, she was not regarded as a kind of prestige actress who chose to grace the screen with her presence, like previous winner Helen Hayes, co-nominee Diana Winyard, or later performers such as Louise Reiner or Elisabeth Bergner. Unless you could teach me to forget a banished father, you must not learn me how to remember any extraordinary pleasure. Catherine Hepburn made her Broadway debut in 1928, but things did not go totally smoothly as she was fired various times and mainly worked as an understudy, occasionally told that she just didn't have the talent or wasn't very good in her parts. You said you were fired though, I can't imagine anybody having the name. No, 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 I was fired from another thing. Yeah, but why? I was fired because what? I wasn't very good. Oh, <laughs> is that the only reason? Yes, well that's usually the reason you're fired. Yeah. Uh, Leslie Howard fired me. He said get rid of that kid fast. What'd you do to him? I said, well, I didn't do anything to him, but I was an inch taller than he was. <laughs> <laughs> That's unforgivable. Funny. You got fired often. Very but physical. that was because I think I wasn't very good, or I was too tall, or they thought I was too fast, mm -hmm. or they just didn't like me. Thought you were too fast in what sense? In the sense well, I, I talk fast and I talk loud, mm -hmm. but I had wonderful thoughts going on inside my head. How did, you, how did you react to being fired? Did you blame them or blame Didn't yourself? Didn't like it. Yeah. No, were... I think I blamed them. I think I was right, too. You think they were schmucks? Well, I thought they wanted something typical. Her breakthrough on the stage finally came in 1932 with a part in The Warrior's Husband that perfectly captured her energetic and unique personality and she was called brilliant, fascinating and delightfully boyish. What did you have to offer as an actress when you were starting off? Well, what have I got to offer as an actress now? You well, tell me. I think it's a sort of idiot's we've profession. Got the we've got the evidence now for what you've got yes, to offer. But then but there wasn't any evidence, was who there? Who knows? Yeah. Who knows why people look at someone? I think it's a question of charisma. I've seen kids that I thought, oh, look, look at him, look at her, do you know? I don't know what it is that, that is the quality that makes one into a freak that is fascinating. But if you, if, you didn't have, if you didn't think much of your own looks, what was your faith in yourself based on? I have no idea, myself. I didn't have anything else. <laughs> what was I going to do? This was mine. After this, things finally improved. Like Diana Winyard, Catherine Hepburn caught the eye of Hollywood with her stage work and would soon make her big screen debut in A Bill of Divorcement. But unlike Diana Winyard, she only had to make her debut opposite one of the Barrymores. What are you looking for? Somebody's movement. Meg! Meg, my own darling! Directed by George Cukor, who would also become a lifelong friend and occasional director of Catherine Hepburn, a Bill of Divorcement was a first-class entry into filmmaking and her unique style took Hollywood by storm. And I, I'm just curious, what, when, when you first got out there, if you settled in and so oh, I thought it was great. I liked it. You did? And I liked movie making. I don't like the theater. Really? No, I think the theater's more well. Because you have to stay up late. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I, I like movies. And, but that was great. <clears throat> and you had to go to work at six o'clock. Then it was fine with me. I was happy to go to work at six o'clock as long as I could go home at five o'clock. Yeah, I know. Movies are made in little bits and pieces. When you were working in the theater, you would work on the stage, you would develop an act, um, a character, um, and you would spend whatever, 90 minutes or two hours with an audience. Did you find it difficult at first working in those little bits and no, pieces? No, no, I and liked all that. Really? Oh, yes. And what? Like movies, like everything about movies. Right from the beginning? Right from the beginning, yes. Um, I do, and the, the, everything about the theater is doomed with me because I'm an early riser and I like to go to bed at 7 or 8 o'clock. Kate did maybe not have the central role in A Bill of Divorcement, but as the daughter of a man who escaped from a mental hospital, she made a definite impression. Critics called her an astounding new screen presence, a genius who was compared to Zara Bernhardt, and everyone agreed that she stole the picture not only by her acting talent, but also her sheer screen presence, and that her dynamic way of sweeping the audience off their feet was a cinematic event in itself. Right from the start, her no-nonsense approach to her role, her peculiar body language and one-of-a-kind vocals, that clear picture of a woman not asking for the viewer's sympathy, made her one of the most unique performers seen on the screen in a long time. It's against my principles to kneel down and say that I'm a miserable sinner. I'm not miserable and I'm not a sinner. Kate being Kate was not intimidated by her famous co-stars or the pressure of her first movie role and instead handled the making of the picture with her usual self-assuredness and afterwards signed a contract with RKO. She next did Christopher Strong, which was her first true starring vehicle and again capitalized on her reputation as a modern independent woman and gave us this iconic outfit. Critics were split in this case, some praising her work, others dismissing it but Kate immediately reached the peak of her early success in Hollywood with her next two movies, Morning Glory and Little Women. I suppose I shall never be wonderful. Not wonderful like them. But I have something very wonderful in me, you'll see. Looking back, it's easy to ask why the Academy did not nominate Catherine Hepburn for one of the most iconic roles of her career and what many considered the definite interpretation of the beloved show March. And that's a good question. Little Women broke opening records at Radio City Music Hall and was among the 10 biggest box office hits of the year. It was also nominated for Best Picture and Best Director and won the Oscar for its screenplay. And on top of that, Catherine Hepburn got glowing reviews for her role, which called her nothing less than superb and that no other present day actress could have been better suited for the part. No, we, we never can be boy and girl again, Laurie. Those happy old times can't come back. And we shouldn't expect them to. And he went back to Broadway. And with all this enormous... Then I did Little Women. Yeah. Which was a really good picture. Yeah. A and uh, for which I should have won the award, you know, for the two of them, yeah. not just for one. Because that was a difficult, not a tricky performance. It was a true American New England girl. And uh, for which I think I was perfectly cast. She said modestly, but I do. And I think George, I think it's a memorable picture for which George Cukor should have gotten 20 awards. However, it seems that Little Women was more seen as the moment Catherine Hepburn arrived as a star and her work was a promise fulfilled. Artistically, there was more interest in the performance that premiered earlier in the year and for many saw the arrival of Catherine Hepburn as an actress. Because even if Morning Glory is mostly remembered today as the movie that won Catherine Hepburn her first Oscar and pretty much for nothing else, her work as a naive, young and aspiring actress made a big impression in 1933 and was undoubtedly seen as the best work she did that year and so far. I know that I'm a great actress. No, no, please be quiet. I'm the greatest young actress in the world. No, no, take and it I'm gonna easy. go on getting greater and greater and greater, you'll see. Morning Glory was apparently initially intended as a vehicle for Constance Bennett. Rumors say that Catherine Hepburn saw the script too and insisted that the role should be hers. Whatever it was, it cannot be denied that the part does seem perfect for her at this stage in her career. A young wannabe actress who thinks very highly of her own talents only to fail again and again before finally having her big breakthrough on Broadway. Oscar voters couldn't ask for a better opportunity. Everything's perfectly glorious, isn't it? Very early in your career, you won an Oscar. Were you playing a girl pretty much like yourself? Was I don't Catherine? think so. 
No, I don't think so. I mean, she was poor. She wasn't arrogant. At least she didn't realize that she was arrogant. Just the way I don't realize that I'm arrogant, and yet I see signs of it. So when I wanted to have lessons, I had no money. And they were, you know, it was about 10 bucks an hour or something like that. It was quite expensive, Frances stuff. She was the best teacher there was. I want to ask you if you could give me a lesson every day right off. But I... I want I, to pay. I, Not at once, because I've only money enough for, well, for a certain length of time. But the reason for her success was not just the role itself, but how Kate brought this character to life. In 1933, Kate's interpretation of Eva Lovelace felt exciting, new, almost unprecedented. Reviews for her work were overwhelmingly positive, describing her as sensational and that she gave one of the screen's greatest performances. That she displayed the kind of magnetism only few actresses in Hollywood history so far possessed. And that her performance made viewers realize the power of talking pictures. Hers was called the most outstanding individual screen work of 1933 and that for poignant beauty, tenderness and a superb understanding of the tragic course of high-hearted but frightened youth at grips with life, Catherine Hepburn's playing in Morning Glory is unsurpassed. Yes, but suppose I do go on tonight and I'm not wonderful. Then everything's gone. If I can't act, there's nothing left. However, it was not just Kate's acting talent that made such a big impression in 1932 and 1933, but her whole persona. Connecticut-born Catherine Hepburn appeared completely exotic on and off the screen. And of course, this exotic aura and unusual screen presence meant that she was also considered the next Garbo, because apparently you can never have enough Garbos. And for some reason, the Academy always preferred the new version to the original. Greta Garbo herself starred in Queen Christina that year, so the Academy could have had the real thing, but we know how that worked out. I think it was being born at the right year for my personality. You know, the pants came in, the low heels came in, the terrible woman came in who spoke her mind. I, I was born absolutely at the right time. And I'm going to die not a moment too soon. But I, you know, that's the story of me. Great timing. The acclaim for her work in Morning Glory, plus her other big success with Little Women, made Kate a pretty easy favorite for the Oscar, with only Mae Robson being considered a potential threat. And so this category came down to the kind of race that we have seen countless times. The new kid versus the veteran. Occasionally the veteran does triumph in this situation, in one case they even tied, and interestingly enough, Kate has been in both situations, but in most cases, the Academy sees its award as an investment. A newcomer is the future. The veteran mostly has had success already and does not really need the award anymore. And especially in its early years, the Academy was still sorting out who should receive its annual honor. It awarded some real stars in its early years, maybe to strengthen its own credibility by being associated with these big names, but these early years also saw performers being recognized for making big first impressions on the screen. It was a pat on the back, an official recognition and most likely a statement of hope that they would continue their work in Hollywood and deliver not only critically praised work, but also bring in a good deal of cash. Which obviously did not always pay off. I made a whole video about that. The desire to invest in the future, to award a young star, even overcame the fact that, while Catherine Hepburn was exciting and new, she was not really popular within the industry that awarded her. Even back then, newspapers reported the muted applause when Catherine Hepburn was announced as the Best Actress winner. Kate's famous aversion to stardom, her unwillingness to be a part of Hollywood and the publicity machine, her reputation as a young up-and-comer who openly spoke her mind and had her own ideas about pretty much everything, right down to her decision to almost only wear pants. All of this is almost a cliché today, but it is based on truth. Right from the beginning of her career, Catherine Hepburn refused to play by the rules, no matter how it would be perceived. I was lucky to be born uh, with a combination of qualities that were apparently interesting in the early 30s when I began to sort of look around and be noticed. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, even before that, uh, you know, when I was a kid in a golf tournament and I sunburned a lot and got blisters and I had to have two caddies, one to carry an umbrella, and I, you know, I'd get the headline on the sport page. 
Hartford youngster. Do you know what I mean? I was just lucky mm -hmm. to apparently be colorful. In this way, both Catherine Hepburn and later Louise Reiner actually were the next Garbos. But only the original was truly untouchable and allowed to be alone and reject publicity. These next Garbos did not have the same luxury. They were maybe praised and considered exotic, but also expected to be more accessible. Maybe a Garbo on the screen, but a typical starlet off the screen. And when they refused, they had to pay the price. Puts terrible things in the newspaper, has millions of reporters annoying me. Kate was in fact openly criticized for her off-screen attitude and the media even wondered if her cry for privacy was not in fact a cry for extra attention. Kate was somebody completely different, but as Louise Reiner would also learn a couple of years later, difference is only exciting for a short amount of time before it becomes suspect. These words by her idol, George Bernard Shaw, could have been written for and about Catherine Hepburn. People are always blaming their circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for circumstances they want. And if they can't find them, make them. For every article that praised Kate at the beginning of her career, there was another one that questioned her acting talent or star power or raised doubts about her outspoken personality and her unwillingness to play by the rules of show business. And obviously, her looks also were a constant discussion in the media, some stating that her beauty has the strength of a supple steel blade, whatever that means. And while an actress like Diana Wynyard was praised for her beauty and her feminine qualities, Kate was mostly referred to as boyish, eccentric, peculiar and unusual. That may be the reason I've never met the man I might be in love with. And it certainly is the reason I've got to keep fit. But in 1933, Kate's attitude and what the media called her electric personality were still interesting and new enough to overcome any dislike in the industry. She did not possess any of the instant charm that many other newcomers who were honored by the Academy displayed in their personalities and their acting. And also none of the expected gratitude. She was the first Best Actress winner who didn't attend the ceremony or appeared in publicity reels and the press also noted that the thank you telegram after the awards was most likely not sent by Kate herself. Why don't I go to the Academy Awards? It has to be that I'm afraid I'm gonna lose, doesn't it? I don't approve of my attitude of not going. I think that's cheap of me. Second rate, second rate not to go. It's a group activity. If Academy members back then had known that Kate would not attend the show, maybe it would have influenced the voting. But as it is, her win was not surprising and, out of this lineup, is also very understandable. Not only because she was the future for Hollywood, she was also the nominee with the most prominent role in this lineup. Critics bluntly stated that she was Morning Glory and the main reason to see it, while Diana Wynyard and Mae Robson had much less significant parts in their movies, often dropping out of the story for long stretches. And finally, her role is basically an Oscar dream. She plays an actress, three out of the first nine Best Actress winners played actresses, she gets to be drunk and she gets to do Shakespeare. It's not obvious Oscar bait, but it clearly falls right into the Academy's ballpark. But just because it does have the ingredients for Oscar, is it really Oscar worthy? Let's find out. It has to be said that even if Eva Lovelace feels like an alter ego of Catherine Hepburn, Kate's performance does never give the impression of what is often described as an actor or actress simply playing him or herself. Her Eva certainly does seem to inhabit Kate's self-assuredness, but she is still an independent and sought-out creation, maybe related to Catherine Hepburn, but not just a copy. And I understand the choices that Catherine Hepburn made in her performance. The script for Morning Glory is actually not offering her a lot. The movie never gives a sense of who Eva is, but only who she wants to be and leaves many questions surrounding her character unanswered. Catherine Hepburn therefore downright attacked the role with a noticeable and surprising style, making Eva a very direct, even pushy character, rushing through her lines as if she is constantly trying to prevent any objection to her words and trying to convince herself of them as well. You've been on the stage long? Not the regular stage, but I was in a lot of plays the Franklin Theatre Guild gave at the Little Theatre. The Little Theatre? Yes, at Franklin, Vermont, where I lived until some time ago. 
This line delivery and her slightly affected voice are the most distinct aspect of Kate's performance. She herself apparently came up with this idea while watching a stage performance by Ruth Gordon and decided that her Eva should be constantly, quote, monotone of voice and observing everything around her. And I'm a big fan of Ruth Gordon. I think it was a brilliant actress. I learned a hell of a lot from her. And I won the award. Copy guy just took call and said I should send you this cap award <laughs> because there it is, it's you. It is an approach that surprises the viewer at first and certainly catches your attention, especially as Eva's voice is so unlike Kate's usual deeper tone and therefore a distinct artistic choice and makes everything about Eva strangely intriguing at first. But it unfortunately begins to feel repetitive and one-dimensional very quickly. Mainly because Kate's voice is usually her strongest tool that can make words be comedic or dramatic or threatening with just a slight change of emphasis and delivery. Millions of years ago, dinosaurs fed on the leaves of those trees. The dinosaurs are vegetarians, that's why they became extinct. They were just too gentle for their size. And then the carnivorous creatures, the ones that eat flesh, the killers inherited the earth. But then they always do, don't they? Well, what family doesn't have its ups and downs? It's what makes many of her performances so memorable and unique and therefore reducing this quality to a never-ending repetition of the same, uninspired way of talking immediately destroys the engaging effect that Catherine Hepburn usually displays on the screen. I can get on on $20 a week. I need more for my lessons. Also, I owe my German teacher at home a large sum, but my debts can wait. I'll play any part that appeals to me for $20. The truth is that Eva Lovelace is neither a well-written nor an interesting character. She does not only feel repetitive due to Kate's acting, but also due to the fact that Morning Glory too often puts her in the same kind of scene and situation, in which Eva obviously tries to hide her insecurities and her desperation to make it on the stage behind a thin layer of self-assuredness. And Catherine Hepburn clearly tried to fight these limitations by giving her a unique spin to make her stand out among similar portrayals of young women trying to make it in show business. And this makes it actually difficult to judge this performance because Catherine Hepburn's approach to that part did give Eva more layers than are intended by the script, but due to the single-mindedness of her characterization, each of these layers still feels rather empty and flat, therefore never creating a truly three-dimensional person. Darling, you've got to pull yourself together. Joseph, I wanted to kill myself when I didn't see him or hear from him. I didn't see any reason to go on. Joseph told me just now that he loved me. And I begged him not to say it. And now I wish I had because I'm lonely. Kate's approach to Eva maybe helped to let her ambition and naive ideas of stardom become understandable, but too often made her character feel out of place within the structure of the story. Her one-dimensional focus on Eva's intrusive nature lacks the necessary believability in her engagement with other characters. The New York Times described Eva as a little irrational, but she actually often comes across as an almost bizarre creation that would most likely be unable to connect with other characters in the way the script is suggesting. Would anybody mind if I went and sat down by that gentleman who was going to wait? The same words that were used to describe Kate, eccentric and unusual, might also apply to Eva, but in her case, this does not make her compelling or interesting. And when that moment comes, when I feel that I've done my best, my very best, I shall really die by my own hand some night at the end of the play. Well, I could have married for money if I'd wanted to. Edwin Talbot, the son of W.E. Talbot, one of the richest men in Franklin, wanted me to marry him. Still, despite this limited approach to the part, there are some singular moments of beauty and humanity in Kate's work. Most of all, I appreciate the fact that Kate gave Eva her own brand of independence, despite a script that basically denies her these qualities. Eva does have a one-night stand with Adolf Menjus, theater producer, but she never makes it seem as if she only wants to use him to get ahead, or that she is later only given her breakthrough role due to this connection. Her seriousness in regards to her craft that she displayed earlier in the movie makes the audience believe that Eva would never accept the part without feeling that she earned it, or that she would use an affair to get what she wants. There is a touching honesty in her work here, clearly displaying that the feelings Eva has for this man are true but still independent from her love for the theater, and when her hopes for a relationship are destroyed, Kate finds more dimensions and growth in her character in a single close-up than in all her on-screen time before. Why, you are the most valuable piece of theatrical property I've ever had. I understand. Unfortunately, the chemistry between Kate and her co-stars is largely unsatisfying. 
Something that is unusual for Kate, who so often shared miraculously believable relationships with her screen partners, but in Morning Glory, they all remain very superficial and feel too rushed and underdeveloped in her work to make any true impact. However, it has to be said that her most famous scene in Morning Glory has rightfully earned its reputation as also being her best. A scene that was described as perhaps the finest bit of versatile acting the screen has ever seen. When Eva drunkenly recites Shakespeare at a party. It works so well because Kesson Hepburn perfectly captures the change in tone. From a rather disappointing drunk scene, complete with cliched slurred speech and affected body movements, she suddenly switches to Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet and does so without making it feel like a big moment for herself, only for Eva suddenly grabbing all attention with an earnest but not out of place display of beauty and talent, giving a quick glimpse into her talents and making her later scenes of success more acceptable. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. It is a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die. To sleep. It's overall commendable that Catherine Hepburn brought Eva to life without simply resting on her own personality, aka simply playing herself, and gave her a distinct and unique humanity. And obviously, showing this kind of versatility at the beginning of her career was an important decision for her later success. But she unfortunately also missed many chances to give more depth and inner life to Eva, surrendering to the limitations of the role without noticing it and only occasionally giving a short look inside the woman she could have been. It's therefore an interesting approach to the role, but not an interesting performance, one that remains strangely unsatisfying and lifeless and stays too often on the surface of a character that could have been far more stirring and alive if it had been given more of Kate's incomparable energy. Au revoir, Royal Empress. Doesn't Antony call Cleopatra the loveliest things? Au revoir.